Be happy. Well, uh, how's the last-minute training going? Well, you know, this has been an exciting week. Um, after two and a half years of training in uh, in Houston and Russia and Japan and um, Germany for the European Space Agency, it all came to an end um, a few days ago when we finished our Russian and so- Russian Space Station and Soyuz uh, qualification exams. Um, and yesterday we had some ceremonial activities with a commission that certified us for flight and a trip to Red Square, and now we have a few days off before we uh, depart Star City for the flight to Baikonur on the 16th, about a week away. Sounds like a a much-needed little break. So um, I know that that this time you and the crew on the Soyuz will be making the first uh, short uh, same-day arrival at the space station. So can you tell me a little bit about why the decision was made to do that now? Why the decision was made, I'm not entirely sure. That's a, um, a, a larger sort of international partnership agreement. But um, it, what it demonstrates is the ability to get us that we can get there quickly on that same on the same day. Essentially, the crew actions are all the same as what we do on a typical rendezvous profile. Just shortened time frame. We have smaller periods of time in between the dynamic uh, events that we do and the burns and things to get us to lined up to rendezvous with the space station. Um, the big, the biggest thing it will help is uh, crew adaptation. Uh, you know, I have never flown on a Soyuz, uh, but I'm told that uh, the solar spin orientation attitude that you do for that those two and a half days while you're waiting uh, is a little hard on your system on that first day. So instead of having to wait in that solar orientation, we'll be just doing dynamic burns all the way to the space station, and we'll do all of, all of our adapting once we get to the ISS. Mm. So this will be your first long-duration space flight. You've flown on a space shuttle before. But what are some of the big differences you're sort of looking forward to experiencing this time around? Mm-hmm. Well, you, you probably are, are know from uh, covering the shuttle missions that uh, the time when you're up there in that two weeks is just so busy. You're constantly trying to stay up, keep ahead with your schedule, or just keep even with your schedule. And, uh, and before you know it, the mission's over. And you really don't have a time to take in the space station and appreciate it and find, explore all the nooks and crannies that it offers. This time, however, that's what I'm looking forward to, having it be my home, knowing where things are. Just like when you move into a new house here on Earth, it takes you a couple weeks before you figure out all the nuances of the drawers and the cupboards and where you want to put things to optimize, optimize your working in the kitchen and, in the, and how you set up your, your uh, computer and things like this. Um, that's what I'm really having looking forward to, having it be a home for me for six months. Mm-hmm. Neat. Well, some of our readers have written in with, with questions that they'd like us to ask you, so if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a few of those on their behalf. Um, sure. A reader named Mick Brown is a scuba diver, and he is asking if you think that flying in space feels anything like scuba diving. It, it feels a lot like that, but the biggest difference is the water really damps out your motions, um, whereas the air doesn't do that very well. So what, by that, I mean if you think you're stopped in space, if you think you're holding yourself perfectly still, there's always some kind of little motion that's going to make you drift out of whatever orientation you want to put yourself in. Whereas in the water, when you're scuba diving, you can stop next to a rock or whatever whatever body of water in a pool or something, and position yourself, and as long as you're neutrally buoyant, you're, gonna, you're not really going to move. You're going to stay right there. So it's the, the difference in the in the way the water and the air react to your body motions, that's the biggest difference. Hmm. Well, somebody named Chavis from Bradford says, uh, Hello, Chris Cassidy. What does space look like from space? Is the luminosity of stars different from the space station than from on Earth? Uh-huh. Um, you know, we're... We're not that much, when, in terms of distances to stars and the moon and everything else, we're really not that much further off than when you're standing on the face of the planet. We're about 200 miles, to 250 miles off of, off of the planet, um, and that distance is pretty insignificant when, you, when you're talking about distance to stars. So I thought that the space, the space environment, when you look out the window, looks largely the same, although the stars are much crisper probably because you're not looking through the, the atmosphere to get to those stars. And uh, um, and the blackness of space is much, much blacker 
but the way the moon looks and the way the stars look to me look relatively the same. Hmm. And a reader named uh, Alain Berger says, uh, "What do you think about the space debris problem, and and is it a big risk while you're in space?" What do I think? I the, I, the first the part I didn't hear. The space debris. I'm sorry. Oh, space and, and debris. Orbital debris. Right, right, right. Um, well, clearly that's a big risk that that's, that we take incur with any space vehicle. And um, the more debris that's up there, obviously, the higher likelihood that you can get hit. And um, there's certain mitigations that are put in place with um, debris shields on critical components and things like this. But that's what we we trained for those scenarios. If if a small particle punched through and made a, time, a leak of different sizes. We, we practiced that over and over and over in Houston and here in Russia on how to respond to leaks and how to isolate the leak and how to, how to make yourself safe. Um, there's also the risk when you launch off a launch pad, and if so, there are some smart people that put numbers to all those risks. And, uh, you know, I, I personally just know that there's the whole mission is associated with risk, but there's really talented people um, in all the different space agencies that are uh, do a great deal of work to mitigate those risks and make them as much as they can under our control. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, Toby Anderson says, um, what will you be taking with you? Any good luck charms or trinkets? <laughs> We're allowed to take a handful of, of things that mean something to us, uh, mementos from our family and things like this. And for me personally, I have um, a little astronaut guy that I actually had with me on every mission that I went on in Afghanistan, and he kept me safe. Uh, he's a little worn, well worn these days as his uh, spacesuit's kind of rubbed off him. He's missing one arm, but uh, he'll definitely be in space with me. Wow. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You bet. Take care, Claire. Okay, Pete. Uh-huh.